brought back to Europe in the 14th century, revived again, and uh, it's a, it's a, it was a set of coordinates. By the 14th century, it evolved into maps, and it actually comes from a book in ancient Greek called The Guide to How to Make a Map, but it doesn't have any maps. At least the surviving versions of that don't have maps, but they tell you how to make one. So we can imagine that they did make a map, but the oldest copies of the map we have are these Byzantine um, copies of the late uh, 14th, 15th centuries. And this is a section which deals with, as you can see, the Malay Peninsula. Here's a peninsula here called the Aurea Carcelnesis, the Golden Peninsula. Coming down, it's got the pretty good idea of the Ganges River system. And here it is called Ganges Pars Extrafluvium, so the, the country beyond the Ganges River. It's got the Great Bay here, which is the South China Sea. And then, but then the coast goes the wrong direction. So they had no idea what was going on east of, east of the Malay Peninsula, basically. Although they knew something about the Mekong Delta as well. But down here they just saw the islands as a bunch of little islands. They didn't know anything about Indonesia at this time. But there was a fair degree of geographical knowledge coming into the Mediterranean via the Indian Ocean about Southeast Asia. And there's one place at the very tip here which is called the Nobimon Emporion, which meant a designated trading port. They actually had a system of ports where you could go and find the same kind of regulations and customs, duties, and so forth. And uh, there's one here called Savannah. So somewhere in this area, there must be a 2,000-year-old trading port. But we haven't found it. It could be down in Rio, it could be up the Doha River. We just have no idea. But somewhere around here, there must be a site like that. So early religions then began to come in via this uh, trading network by the third, fourth centuries. We begin to get both Vishnu as well as Shiva, Hindu deities, and also Buddha. And these are wooden Buddha statues excavated in the Mekong Delta. So already by the third or fourth centuries, these have been radiocarbon dated. And there is a book that one of our members, James Ku, actually edited on Hunan. And, uh, of course, before there were stone statues, no doubt there were wooden statues. And because of the Mekong Delta being some, in some places peat bogs, you get preservation of wood. Whereas in other areas, of course, they wouldn't survive. So we do have wooden Buddha statues which predate uh, the earliest stone images. So all we can say is that there must have been a lot more of this kind of information about early contacts, early religions between Southeast Asia and India. But then until they started carving things out of stone, they wouldn't have survived. First writing in Southeast Asia is again around the 3rd, 4th century, so all these things seem to come in as a complex. Architecture made out of brick and stone, um, the carving of statues, the uh, depicting Indian deities, and the use of an Indian script to write. And this is the oldest known inscription from Southeast Asia. It's actually the far eastern tip of the Southeast Asian mainland in what is now South Vietnam. But um, in the earlier times, it was known as Champa, which is another Malayo-Polynesian-speaking kingdom. And that's called the Bokain inscription. It comes from Natrang. It's near Punagar, where later on, of course, the Cham did build these kinds of great temples like this, eight, nine centuries. And of course, our secretary, uh, Alex Young, uh, of course, is from there. And he's writing his PhD dissertation on this area in the early sea trade. And it's in that area that the first Singapore appears. So Singapore is an old name in Southeast Asia. It didn't just appear suddenly out of nowhere in the 14th or in the 19th century. The first Singapore in Southeast Asia was in Hunan, uh, the kingdom of Hunan. Up here, the Singapore is more or less the eastern tip of the, the Southeast Asian mainland. Here's Ponagar down here. And this is the remains of that actual site. This is a stairway from an old temple. So even before this Singapore and Southeast Asia, there was already a Singapore in India, at least in the Indian mythology. But there was a real Singapore, we don't know, a lion city. But there, one of the places where Buddha lived in one of his incarnations was known as the lion city, Singapore. But we don't know of any site in India today that actually is still called that. 
there may have one, been one, or it might have just been a kind of a kind of a, a metaphor for Buddha's the power of Buddha's voice when he's preaching the Dharma. Uh, and of course, then you have Ashoka and his lions and so forth. So it's a, it has a Buddhist connotation already. And that's what the hill looks like today. It's become a Catholic shrine. So it's like Fort Canning. It's, it's like uh, Bukit Saguntal in Palamon. It's like the St. Paul's Hill in Malacca. All the early Malay cultural centers were on hills overlooking rivers. They all chose very specific kinds of geographic, you know, geographical situations to set themselves up. And there are still these kinds of ruins of the third, fourth century lying around the slope of this hill. South Thailand, there was another one in the area later on known as Long Kasuka, by the sixth century, mentioned in Chinese sources. In the 15th century, during the Majapahit period, there is one in West Java, a known from the Charyosan Prabhu Siddhiwangi. Siddhiwangi is a great uh, Sundanese war hero, cultural hero. And there is still a Singapore in Thailand, except it's pronounced Sing Buri. <laughs> but Sing Buri is Singapore. It comes from the Khmer period. And of course, there's a very large Khmer shrine on that site still today. So during the Khmer Empire, 12th, 13th century, there was another Singapura in central Thailand. Uh, so you see, the, the name Singapore here was not something abnormal, something out of the ordinary. It fitted in perfectly with the Southeast Asian maritime culture, going back long before the 14th century. So it was all over the place. And it even went as far as the USA. <laughs> <laughs> Singapore, after the, uh, 1819, became so famous, so prosperous, so quickly, that American prospectors decided they were copying it. And so they built the Singapore on the banks of Lake Michigan. <laughs> and it was a, for, it actually worked fairly well for about 20 years until Chicago overtook it. So then it became a ghost town. But there, there, there are still ruins of Singapore, Michigan, <laughs> on the bank of Lake Michigan. And here you can see now it's being covered over by sand dunes. But it still exists, and so there is this historical marker. So it, was, it had three mills, uh, two hotels, several general stores, and um, it outshone its neighbor to the south as Saugatuck, Michigan, was then called. But the supply of timber, which it depended on for its prosperity, eventually was all um, cut down. And you can still go and visit Singapore in the USA as well. Anyway, Sri Vijaya. So Sri Vijaya was known, of course, as the first great Malay trading port. Uh, uh, but it was, uh, in fact, it was kind of the result of the movement southward. The first early Malay trading port we know of was in South Thailand. This is the one in the third, fourth century BCE where they found this uh, um, uh, Western Han uh, earthenware pottery. Then the Bujang area of Kadah, where of course the Sarnath Society visited about three, four years ago. And then it moved further south to a place called Barus on the west coast of Sumatra, which is well known to the Arabs and the Persians for its camphor. And then of course in South Sumatra, Palembang. So Palembang was about the fifth, fourth or fifth, in a sequence of evolution. You can see the center of the whole Malay trading culture shifting southward. And then it moved back north again to Singapore and eventually up to Malacca. Now, Kada, of course, has a special importance for me because that's where I lived 45 years ago when I came in the Peace Corps at the foot of that mountain, Kada Peak. And uh, uh, lo and behold, I discovered that there was actually an ancient civilization there. I was not involved in archaeology at that time. I'd done a bachelor's degree on Eskimo <laughs> in northern Canada. And I wanted to go to Northeast Asia. I wanted to go to somewhere like Korea or, um, or Nepal, but they sent me to Southeast instead. And they told me to go and set up farmers' cooperatives in the Bujang Valley when they were setting up these new um, big irrigation systems, the Muda scheme, the Muda River, and so on. And so they put me at the base of this mountain, and I was going around and um, setting up farmers' cooperatives and seeing lots of old ruins and lots of ancient pottery, which no one knew anything about. And it was at that point that my interest sort of became inevitably attracted to this type of topic. And that was our view from Kenna Peak from the hotel we stayed at back in 2011. 
And that was a very important landmark because it's right at the tip of the sailing route which leads west from the Straits of Malacca. Very strategic location. So if you want to go between India, South India, and Sri Lanka, go straight across the Bay of Bengal without having to go all the way north and south again, you head due east and then you hit Kedapi. And it shows you that you've reached the main mainland and you've reached a source of fresh water. Critical for ships which have been at sea for some length of time. So it's a very good landmark as well. And recent excavations in the Bujang area have pushed back the development of some kind of brick architecture, maybe as far as the second century of the Common Era. This is a Sumagatu site. And um, of course, the dating is still, I would have to say, rather provisional. But there's very strange structures here. This one, as you can see from the, the top, it's a bit of an actual kind of a sign here because you can't see from the side. But there's a square on top of a circle. And we have no idea what this structure is meant to symbolize, because there's nothing else like it that we know of anywhere. And, but it has been dated by carbon back to the second century. And in the site museum there, there are quite a number of remains of boats. There's no explanation. There is no information about where they came from, why they're there. All that uh, I can work out from seeing them is that they are in the old Malay style. They've got these kind of lashed lugs. They carved the, boat, the, the boats out of logs, big logs, but they left these things. These are part of the original tree, and they carved all the way around them and left these things sticking up with holes through them. That's how the boats were tied together. Now, the Arab doll that you can see if you go to the Maritime Museum on Sentosa is a done, it's also done by lashing, but the lashings go through the planks. They don't have these lugs on them. So they're similar in some ways to Arab dowels, but they're quite easily distinguished by the presence or absence of these lugs, where the lashings actually go. So two similar, but uh, fundamentally, technically different ways of building ships. There have been no dates on these ships, on these boats here. We have no idea what context they came out of. I haven't been able to find out anything about them. And we get the first Buddhist inscriptions in Southeast Asia from Kada. This is the famous Buddha Gupta inscription. Oldest Buddhist text in Southeast Asia. It's got a stupa on it. Um, this is where it came from, down here along the Buddha River. And there's another early inscription, more or less the same type, found in a place called Ubenria. And these are prayers for um, safe, safe voyaging. Buddha Gupta was the name of the actual sea captain, Maha Nawika in Sanskrit. These are all in Sanskrit. Um, they were using this kind of a script here, which well, probably evolved in South India, called Palawa. Although my friend, the Indonesian epigrapher, Harlow Griffiths, doesn't like the name Palawa, so I have to always qualify it when I use it. But that's what historians always call it, after the Palawa kingdom. And um, Sunai Mas down here, this has become very popular uh, recently. A lot of research has been done here. This is a Tang Dynasty site with Changsha type wares on it. Um, after Kada, then the next important site to look at for the definition of kind of Malay or let's say Southeast Asian maritime culture is Southeast uh, Sumatra. There has been a fair amount of research done in this area in the last 20 years, mainly by the Atoll Francaise Extreme Orient. There's quite a bit of early history from the 19th century about the site also, and it indicates one very important facet of a lot of this adaptation. It was built over water. People, for the most part, did not live on land. They lived on rafts or on boats, on water, and so when there were floods, so it uh, happens every rainy season almost, instead of being tied to the ground, you would go up and down with the water. It's kind of like the Nile. It doesn't, it doesn't have a huge, strong current. It just water gradually rises and your house goes up with it. And when it goes down, again, your house goes down. You don't have any problems. But, except archaeologists have problems. <laughs> because all the stuff sinks in the river. And it's covered up under the mud every year. And so it's almost impossible then to actually detect most of the remains of these ancient habitations over water. This is modern Jambi, the same thing. People mostly live over the water at the edge of the land, um, but their remains are all their kind of rubbish and uh, so forth is going to fall under the water. 
This is the Moosey River. This is 90 kilometers from the river mouth. It's still tidal. Um, and um, that's where the capital of this uh, kingdom was, definitely. And this is the supposed the place where the first Malay ruler appeared on Earth, Bukit Segunta. And it's now become a public park with some strange kind of structures built on it. But there are remains of ancient Buddhist shrines here as well. No doubt this is a place where the famous Chinese Buddhist pilgrim Mi Ching actually spent maybe three or four years learning Sanskrit before going to India. It was a center of Buddhist Sanskrit, Mahayana Buddhist Sanskrit learning. There's Chinese wear here from the Tang Dynasty, this kind of Yue wear, the very well-known southern Chinese green wear with the spur marks is kind of the predecessor of the later Song Dynasty green celadons. There's also Middle Eastern luster wear from Persia, indicating uh, that this was a very important connecting node all the way from South China to West Asia. A lot of numerous Buddhist remains found here, these votive tablets with prayers, stamped on them, very tall Buddhist images, and also indications of Mahayana Buddhism. The, the presence of beings such as the Bodhisattvas, this one is all the Kavala indicating it was quite different from the later Southeast Asian Buddhism that you find all the way from Burma to Cambodia, South Vietnam, even now Central Java again today. Uh, there are remains of various kinds of shrines, and inscriptions. Now this one is quite important because it seems to echo a theme which you find in the Malay Annals. It's an inscription which contains an oath of loyalty to the ruler. And on the top of it, it's got these seven protuberances. Those are actually nagas. Those are like cobra heads or dragon heads. Uh, so it's a seven-headed naga, which one later on finds very frequently in uh, Cambodian and Thai statues of Buddha, the naga sheltering Buddha during his meditation. And you can see there's a little, another protuberance here. This is like a trough. What happened was they poured water over the words of the oath. So the, the, the officials of the kingdom had to take an oath of loyalty to the ruler, saying they would never disobey the ruler, and then they would collect the water at the base of this uh, trough and drink it. And symbolically, the water would turn to poison and kill them if they ever violated the words of their oath. And the Thai sultans of Kedah and Purlis still did this in 1900, except then they were going up to Bangkok. <laughs> but they, that's how the Thai still ruled the Malays of what is now North Malaysia, was still South Thailand in 1900. It was still part of Thailand in 1900. That was that they would make them drink this oath of loyalty to the Thai king. Was it such an old Malay tradition? still persisted almost until modern times. Yi Ching, I mentioned already, he was a famous uh, Buddhist pilgrim who sailed in. He's famous partly because he left a very good description of his travels from China to Southeast Asia and back again. So he went all the way by sea. He didn't follow uh, Swan Tsang and the other famous earlier ones who went overland. He went both ways by sea. And he mentions many other Chinese Buddhist pilgrims who by his time, this is the seventh century Tang Dynasty period, were doing the same thing as he was. The sea route had replaced the land route already as a means of transmission of Buddhism. So a lot of really Chinese Buddhist statuary, for example, shows more of a northern Indian influence. Whereas later, by the 7th, 8th century already, Southeast Asian Buddhist statues begin to have more of a correlation than maybe one could say even an influence on southern Chinese Buddhist imagery. And so these are the various routes. You could either go straight up like Yiching to Bengal, which is of course near where Buddha actually used to live, or you could go across to South India, where there are also, at this time, major Buddhist monasteries as well, places like Megapatana. And then he went back eventually to North China, that's of course the Wild Goose Pagoda in Xi'an. Wild Goose, of course, being another famous Chinese artistic motif, as Patricia has told us recently. And no, you've still got to go, of course, I think. Because you can't complain if I don't <laughs> credit you for using your map. These are all her map. <laughs> um, now, people recently have been, well, a couple of years ago, they had the Sea Games in Palemba. Some of you may know, they're now on in Myanmar. But a couple of years ago, they were held in Palemba. And they had to find a lot of sand to build structures in Palemba. 
And when they were dredging up the river bottom, they started discovering lots of ancient objects under the river, including these gold objects. There was a huge amount of artifacts discovered without any archaeological research being done. These are all in people's private collections now. Um, they, they, they have rings and there are hilts for sea crease and swords and all kinds of other materials like this. So indication uh, which confirms what I had been suspecting for a long time, that a lot of the Javanese gold I wrote about in my book about Javanese gold is actually Sumatran gold. Because there is no gold in Java. The gold ore itself had to come from this belt of minerals which goes right along the equator. South Sumatra, southern Malay Peninsula, like Pahang, across northern Borneo, across into the South Philippines, that's where all the gold is. And that strip along the equator. And it seems like now that they were probably actually making gold stuff in Sumatra to fit with the Javanese preferences, or maybe even the Javanese were following Sumatran styles. Without any archaeological material, we'll never be able to settle that question. Though. 